Well, a, a lot of it is, is, uh, is just in the blood. And I was thinking about this recently and kind of trying to track my own earliest interest in technology. And as I was growing up uh, in Bloomington, Indiana, long ago, there was a neighbor who had a, a wire recorder. I'm not sure you know there were such things, but before there were tape recorders, they recorded on wire. And um, the, uh, I used to go over and, and, uh, and watch this amazing machine that would record your voice. And he actually got something else and gave it to me when I was 10 or 11 years old. And, and uh, it uh, you know, was just an example of fa how fascinated I was early on by, by technology. Uh, when I was in my teens, I um, wanted to buy my own tape recorder. And uh, as I recall, it was about $150 at a time when that would be well over $1,000 today. And for a couple of years, my, I just saved money from Christmas, birthdays, you know, little odd jobs to buy this portable 45-pound tape recorder. Uh, and so for me to kind of watch some of these things become more and more available has been wonderful. And a good case in point, when I first came to Eastern in 1972, uh, I was already interested in using film in the classroom. Now in those, those days, you probably know it was 16 millimeter film, the projector. You'd have to rent the film, have it shipped in three months in advance, line up the, project, the, the projector and the projectionist. And halfway through any film, there was that kind of uh, soul destroying <laughs> as the film broke. And then there'd be an awkward 10 minutes while I got the film going again and off it would go. But it was, it was film and it was exciting and it was a variety. And the first two scholarly projects or research projects, publications I did at Eastern shortly after graduate school uh, were to write two articles for a magazine called The History Teacher, one on film and history in general and the other on films on the American Revolution because we were coming up on the, on the bicentennial. And um, for a couple of months I had, if you'd go into my office, uh, there was a stack of films probably four feet high on uh, these big film 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 boxes that people sent in uh, for my doing both of those articles um, so there again it was sort of you know an early example of being being fascinated by film but um, one of the things I've found just tremendously gratifying in academic life in the last 10 years it's probably not been much more than that the way that the new technology has kicked in for for classroom use of course Email was available before that and, and a little bit on the web. But to be able to take um, a film clip and to present it in the classroom, uh, the, the, uh, that's an incredibly exciting thing for somebody who for years had watched Hollywood movies and thought, oh, I wish I could have the way they present the Battle of Yorktown and bring it into the classroom. Pretty much impossible in those earlier days. But in the last 10 years in particular, the, the software for getting the films, taking clips out of films, um, the smart classrooms where you can put the film on a big projector. When I first came, we were just using little TV screens uh, for the films. Um, so it's, it's something, uh, I, was, I was longing for all of this stuff long before it arrived. And it seems to me particularly the last three, four years have just put all of the pieces together. Something like editing my own films with iMovie, which I couldn't have conceived of doing just a few years ago. So it's partly an enthusiasm for what keeps coming along, but it was also an enthusiasm that was there way back in the days of the wire recorder. Well, there's no single answer to that, but a number of stories that I'd like to tell you that uh, I think illustrate that. Um, and just examples of what I do. For one thing, uh, I do my best to learn student names. And class of 25, I can usually do it pretty easily. 50, it gets harder. 110, really hard. I've never done it, Got, gotten them all. But in the early days, when I arrived at Eastern, I had a Polaroid camera, and I'd line up people and take Polaroid shots of them, photocopy the Polaroid, cut out the pictures, put them over the names. And, and it was pretty laborious, and it was just black and white, but it helped. But nowadays, I'll go into the, may I demonstrate here? Sure. Show and tell. Uh, currently, I'm using this camera, which is a Canon, uh, uh, what do they call it, a power, power shoot, power shot. Uh, and it's good enough that I can go around and take pictures of people, make a movie 
I have them take, tell their names, and then I can actually I've got the movie now on my computer, but also in my iPhone. So at random points, I can just pull it out and and uh, and work on learning the names. So that would be one one way. Uh, movies, I do a lot with movies, uh, as I indicated before, taking films, documentaries, and and uh, Hollywood type movies using clips in the classroom. Uh, but I'm beginning to get more and more involved in taking my own movies and incorporating them. Now I've yet to manage to raise the funds to create, recreate a Civil War battle or something like that. But I do have, um, uh, of course, the, the, the Hollywood movies and the documentaries take care of that. But uh, I like to visit sites and, uh, and, and take pictures. Good case in point, you know, a lot of our students at Eastern if they tell you they've been east, they might mean they got across the Montana border. Now, obviously, some got all the way to the east coast, but, but for quite a few of my students, I can't assume they know the terrain of the east. And uh, a few years ago, I was having them read a book about Washington's crossing the Delaware, which is one of the iconic moments of the American Revolution. He was basically down to two or 3,000 soldiers fighting the British Empire, and there's no way he should have been able to win. But he crossed the Delaware in the night and surprised the uh, British Hessian soldiers nearby, won a victory that really, momentum-wise, uh, turned the tables on the British, and crossing the Delaware. It's a river. And the students had read a book about this, and we had a film uh, that reenacts it. But I was back in, uh, in Pennsylvania, went down to the site, took a movie uh, on a Monday probably Monday morning, because uh, later that day I boarded a plane and came back to Cheney. So Monday I was at the Delaware filming, there's some historical buildings there, filming the place where he crossed the Delaware. Tuesday I was in the classroom and I was able to say to the students, I'd like you to see what the Delaware, uh, Delaware River looked like yesterday. You know, and from that moment on you could hear a pin drop. I mean, they're just sort of on the edge of their chairs. And I showed it, and it's not too often students just clap in the middle of a lecture, but they, they were so excited. And, um, you know, often in teaching, you have a lesson plan, an idea, and you begin to visualize the excitement of the students and so on. And sometimes it falls flat completely, and, and often maybe it doesn't, it's, it's okay, but it doesn't quite live up to your expectations. This one, I was thinking, holy smokes, you know, what have I done here? This is much more than I, than I expected. Well, for one thing, I couldn't do the multimedia in the classroom without the enhanced classrooms. And uh, it's wonderful the way, you know, in the old days, there were just a few enhanced classrooms and there were big lecture halls. It's wonderful the way you can go into a classroom with just, you know, seating for 10 or 15 students and you still you have, you have the capability of hooking up your computer. Uh, so that would be one place where the campus has made, you know, Eastern's investment in this has made a huge difference. I'm also... Um, actually currently working on trying to upgrade my, my uh, understanding of Blackboard and my use of Blackboard. And uh, the, uh, I had used it in the past mainly for course announcements, which is useful, a kind of common place for it. But um, I noticed this last quarter um, that I had more uh, students either failing the class or doing poorly than I like. I tell the students at the beginning, you do your work and I want you to get a three point out of this. And there are just a few more 1.5s and 2.5s and a few little scattering of 0.0s than I'd like to see. And I'd never used the gradebook in, uh, in, uh, in Blackboard. But sometimes you have to identify a need before you use the technology that's there. And uh, I'm uh, getting a lot of help uh, from you guys on campus uh, to figure out how to do the gradebook and things like that. And, the multifaceted gradebook where one kind of assignment counts for some amount of points and others for other. And I'm very excited about the possibility of, um, of using that to show students where they are. And the point you know, about students not doing too well is I think part of it might be that in the third and fourth week they, don't, they may be doing worse than they think they are. And I've been just practicing with uh, an enrolled, a hypothetical enrolled student named Bob and giving Bob different grades and seeing how it affects the overall grade as a whole. 
And I can see that would be very useful. I mean, I see putting it through the big projector and Bob's not gonna be embarrassed because he's, he's a hypothetical imaginary student, but I'm gonna say, here's Bob on steroids, you know, folks. This is what happens if he does 10 hours homework, does well on his quizzes. This is what happens if he misses three classes and I'll be able to illustrate it. So um, not only am I appreciating the technology that we have on campus for what it, I've already used, but uh, I'm very impressed with the continuing areas of growth that are out there. A lot of what I've done in getting films ready, I've done on my own with my Mac and with iMovie and, and camera and so on. And thank goodness the price is you know, something that would have been $20,000 um, uh, just a few years ago is now 500 and 10 years ago or 20 years ago wouldn't have existed at all. Uh, so those things are available and I've, I've been bought, bought a pretty nice Pro-Am camera, have my Mac, I have iMovie so I can edit films, uh, things of that sort, and then the film clips that I can take and edit on my own. So part of it is using the campus technology to project something onto the big screen. I'm also, with Blackboard, uh, beginning to st start streaming clips. And good case in point, I'm doing a seminar now, a capstone seminar on the history of disease. And uh, one good way to get students thinking about disease in general is through some uh, pretty good films out there on it. Some, you know, you hear somebody's sick and you, know, you never see them, a film doesn't really tell you much. Uh, I particularly like a film called Outbreak, which has its corny moments, but also has some historically pretty accurate moments showing you different kinds of technologies and so on and the way plagues spread. And um, it's a two-hour film with, um, it's a great story and sometimes it wanders, there's a romance in it and uh, it, it helps make the film interesting. It doesn't necessarily tell you too much about the disease except the woman catches it. So I guess that, that brings you into it. But more importantly, there, there, are, there are clips in there. It's a, a, a visit to a laboratory and uh, the laboratory shows you what's called biosafety levels. And there's certain kinds of diseases where we could just walk in and maybe put a mask on and, and work with the, uh, the microbes. And then at various levels, you put more and more on, and the highest level is diseases like Ebola, where you have to have this spacesuit, basically, where you go into the lab. And in the film, there's about a two minute where they just kind of, they're walking down this corridor and it just click, 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 biosafety level one, mentions some diseases, biosafety level two, and and so on. And to tell you how bad it gets, even AIDS is only biosafety level three. Biosafety level four is scary stuff. Uh, well, two minute clip, they see it in class, but I now have it on the Blackboard site so they can click on that and, uh, and review it as many times as they want. Uh, now, honestly, I'm not sure what the underlying technology is I'm using. I think it's something stream. Uh, it's share stream. Share stream is the, is the particular technology. Uh, I'm interested in all of it. I, I think iTunes U would be a great, it's, it's an area I'd like to develop. In fact, I was sort of a little bit side railed from my career in technology for a few years, first in faculty government and then as ch department chair. And I'm glad I did that. And I'm also glad now that I'm back to being able to teach and do research and writing full time. And I, I figure I'm gonna try to kick it into a higher gear. And as I look at what I can do, and you know, we have an Apple store in Spokane now, I can go in there and get instruction from them. But also on campus, I plan to exploit you guys <laughs> as much as I can to, to get some more lessons in, in how to do this stuff. Because there is so much out there. I mean, it's, I won't say it's gonna be quite as complex as getting a PhD in history, but you know, there's, there's, there are higher levels of, of education in using these things. And I'm very excited about the fact that there's a, there's a match here, just like I, I was like a, a kid in a, a candy store when the Apple store came in because of this training that they offer. And it's a lot harder to get it over in Seattle. Same thing here is, is I'm finding questions and don't really know how to answer them. To have real human beings makes a huge difference. To be able to sit down with people and, and, uh, and, and talk about these things makes a huge difference. Another of the things where I make uh, a lot of use of technology and, and love the capabilities out there 
is uh, there are a number of times, probably two hours a day, when I find myself in a position where I could listen to something but not necessarily be reading a book. And uh, I'm finding ways to digitize books and then actually from the digitization to get a recording. I mean, it's a computer recording, but they're better and better now. It's not just a robotic sound. And uh, in fact, today, a little bit later on, I'll be teaching a graduate seminar where I will have done my homework by walking around doing dishes and listening to uh, some of the assignment that way. Um, and this is probably two hours a day that um, wasn't dead time at all. It's, there are other things you can do, listen to music, but, but you know, driving into Spokane or whatever, that's yet another use of technology that I find absolutely fantastic. And I'm going to be actually experimenting with something tonight with my students. I want them to read um, an account, an autobiography of a woman who was captured by Indians, Puritan woman, uh, back in the 1670s, so well over 300 years ago. And I want them, they haven't done, haven't had a homework assignment yet, it's their first week in class. They'll be reading, uh, the next week they will have read at home, but they don't have anything like that. So I want them to read in class. And often I find when you do that, you have the fast readers that are reading at one speed, and then the slower at another, and there's that kind of awkward period where some people are finished and others not. And I'm actually going to use the recording. It's, this is kind of an experiment, but say, look, I want us to keep it pretty much the same spot in this reading right now because I'm going to be constantly stopping and talking, and I want it about it, and I want us to have right very fresh in our minds just where we've been. So, and I'm kind of experimenting with this and trying it out, but another example of, of the use of the technology. Now, in general, you know, it's kind of an interesting question. What is... Um, what difference has technology made? Um, because some of the things I do, I do the same. One of the most effective things, I'm glad to say it's still effective, and you know they say, oh, you should redo your syllabus, redo your course. If you got something good, go with it and stay with it. And one of the things I did those, not quite 40 years ago when I first arrived, but in the first couple of years, I began role-playing a Puritan minister. And I'd say to the students, you be the congregation, you've done a little reading on this, well, men on one side of the room, women on the other. That's the way the Puritans did it. We're back in 1650, and I'm going to preach, and then I want you to ask questions in character, as if you were Puritans. And this would be typical of a Puritan sermon, that the, 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 the preacher would invite you to talk. Well, we do that, and I did it just a couple of months ago. And it's always one of the things at the end of the class that they remember best. And the point there is that there are exciting things you can do in the classroom in the way of discussions, lecture, role-playing. Sometimes I deliver Patrick Henry's Liberty or Death speech and so on. Um, as I get older, part of the fun of being a historian is things that I've seen. Like I actually saw and was stood close enough to see the, the sweat on his brow as Martin Luther King spoke at Berkeley in 1968. Well, those things, they are just as engaging as any other kinds of technology. So. But I'm just saying this to underscore my answer to your question. Why technology? What does technology add to it? And I would just say that it, it, it doubles and triples the wow moments, those moments when students really get it, when they see there's something deep and important in history. Um, it's just a wonderful tool to take them to another level. That I think of in terms particularly of film. Uh, but then these many other devices, like using Blackboard to stay in closer touch with students. Uh, to uh, refine assignments, to answer questions. Uh, that's huge. Uh, and so it's a, it's a whole new realm of, of uh, learning. And I like the fact that it's not just wiping out the old stuff. You know, it's not as if the old stuff is ir irrelevant at all. It's that it just is a magnificent, a magnificent accompaniment to what we already have. A, a bit of history would go with that since I'm in math and then you actually look at the technology behind teaching math, you know, you know, at some point if you've lived long enough, it's, you know, calculators, wow, should they be in the classroom? Yes, no, we shouldn't use them, you know, a type of technology, but it starts there. And then, of course, 
being technology, it changes rapidly. So I'm old enough to think, oh, calculators. Now we have graphing calculators. Should we use them? Can we talk about graphs and instead of drawing it all or, or doing it on the paper, can we actually demonstrate it? And then the technology changes. Now we don't have graphing calculators. Now we've got computers and, and applets, and now we can do all this. So the technology expands. But as an educator, I have to ask, how does this help uh, the end result, which is the teaching and the learning for their students, meaning K-12, the kids in the classroom. And then I also get to able to look, how does that affect in the college environment with these prospective or pre-service teachers? How can that get them to relate to the material? So yeah, technology changes and you have to ask yourself what works, what doesn't. One thing I find for myself uh, you don't really know until you until you try it. You can look at the research and think about what people say, this works, this doesn't. But for me, um, part of it's personality, but part of it's philosophy. If I see something, my inclination is a, a new kind of technology. My inclination is to say, uh, what can I get it to do for me with these students? So I, I, I've been fortunate at Eastern that we have um, a lot of things that we can use. I've been here eight years and I can tell you that um, a lot of the th things that I've done, of course, just in eight years, never done anywhere else. Things like smart boards, now you see them all over the place. We have, we have public school districts getting grants to put all these smart boards in. Here at Eastern, we start seeing these physical uh, smart boards being installed. Who's using them? Who doesn't use them? How could they be used? Just, that's just one example. So in my math classes, I start thinking, all right, so now we're drawing on the smart board. We can capture those lessons. Um, we can modify them. We can replay them. And then I start thinking of, this is where I, you get to have your creative streak going. You think, what else could we do? Well, I notice that um, in math education, we're often working with different manipulatives, different uh, toys, if you will, but we're, we're using blocks and tiles and, 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 and circles and graph. We've got all this stuff out there, and we're model essentially modeling mathematics. But what happens is when you want to share what you're doing with your teammates or your classmates who are there in the room, it's very difficult. They're either all going to stand up and come over and look at the table and you think, well, they'll stand up in front of the classroom. Well, you can't because you have all these base 10 blocks and you've got these triangles and polygons. So we started bringing in some, some video <laughs> cameras and still cameras. I'll just describe one project that I did. We got this published. Imagine different table groups. This is over in Kingston Hall. I've got these table groups of students. Gave them digital cameras. I said, I want you to archive what you're doing, kind of like a, a slideshow. Here's what I did. Here's what happened next. Here's this problem I'm trying to solve. These teams of students were able to get those digital photographs taken, imported into the computer, put up on the smart board, and then when we're sharing and we're discussing what's happening, they're up there, they're annotating it, they're drawing on there, they're showing what's happening. Next slide, and we're able to save it, replay it next week. Do you remember when so-and-so said this? And how did, would you think one of your students might react to this? Again, using that technology, um, things that we had on hand, they were very adept at using those cameras to get those pictures going, but in a new way to import what they're actually doing into the smart board, reflect on it, with the purpose of promoting that class discussion and generating some ideas which we can record and save for future use. So that's just an example. Smart boards, I had never used them before I came to Eastern. Specifically, there's a, a one a big motivation for using this um, wireless slate was well, first of all, we had them in the department uh, due to one of my colleagues. Uh, when you have shared interest in technology, you tend to feel that that energy f uh, feeds off each other and you get new ideas. So uh, uh, Dr. Keith Adolfson had, had ordered these wireless slates. Oh, what do they do? Well, I found that they basically um, were like a wireless Bluetooth connected mouse, but also you could draw on it. And with the smart notebook software, what I found is it, it mimics a smart board. Basically, everything that I did on the actual hard, uh, you know, wired uh, smart board up there, I could do this on the slate, 
with the advantage that I could take that slate to the different table groups instead of the students coming up and writing on this if there were some different slates out there oh what do you see over there here you go show me what you see and the student could take that and draw and write but with a really big advantage for me um, which is that I no longer need that actual big smart board if I don't have it and this leads me to the what you were talking about when I went to on a Fulbright scholarship to Africa uh, there, there, I didn't see any smart boards. I was in villages in, in Tanzania and other places, and it made me think even here of Eastern, of the rooms where, oh, there's no smart board uh, in this. There's just a screen and a projector, but not a problem. Because now I have my laptop and a projector, and I've got that wireless slate. So I can project that and essentially mimic all the functions that I want uh, of the smart board, being able to show the slides, demonstrate student work, have them share their thinking all on this uh, on this Bluetooth uh, wireless slate, and it's and I can and it's very lightweight too. Um, so that's an example of that. And you asked about integrity, and there's two components of that. I'll I'll speak to the teaching aspect of it, um, and the research aspect. I'll speak to the research first because um, part of the use in technology and where we get the funding for this is you do need to disseminate those ideas when you have something that works and you have other colleagues around the world. Uh, where, where my colleagues are, they think, what works? What doesn't work? Um, you've got to find a way to publish and write about some of the cool things. This is something that I like to do. It's very difficult work, but you can't publish research unless you have something interesting to say, and you don't have something interesting to say until you, you work on it and capture it. When I say capture it, that's leading me to the video component. So some of the things I've already described anecdotally, like when my students were working, photo, video, smart board, slate. I need a way to capture some of the learning environment in a way that I can share it with, with other people who are off campus or all around the world. So I started, before, te before I knew about Tegrity, which is a fantastic streamlined way of doing what I used to do, I'd have uh, video cameras here or there, or I'd just try to videotape people or, or video people's work, find a way to import it, you know, now we have YouTube and other ways, so I could reflect on these videos and share what's happening. Here's how we're using the technology. So it was a, I was very research-minded at the beginning. So now I come to Eastern, this is only in the last uh, year. Well, Tegrity is, what does that do? Well, it really facilitates um, lecture capture and also capturing anything else I want to see that's happening in the classroom. Uh, I can use Tegrity to do that. So I said, well, let me learn about that. Now, I mentioned research, how I wanted to capture this to reflect and, and publish. But, of course, I think Tegrity was probably designed foremost for the, for the students and the teaching environment. So, what do I do with Tegrity now, or what have I done? I, I only uh, started using it last quarter when, uh, when Dave Dean and, <laughs> and Nick, they said, here's how easy it is. And I think it was Grant was in there, too. He said, it's this fast. Now, I'm as much as I love technology, I want it to be intuitive. I want it to be easy and I don't want to mess around with it too much. And that's what impressed me about Tegrity. Um, especially when I sat with Dave and he said, oh, did you know about it? It's this tab right here. Click on it and it just starts, rec <laughs> it just starts recording apparently. And it goes somewhere. I think uh, the tech people will tell you the cloud or the server or something. I don't know where it goes. But I wanted to try it in my classroom because of the cool things that I was doing or thought I was doing and wanted to capture whether it was cool or not. But instead of having to set all this stuff up, here's what I do. So I'll describe a little bit of what happened last quarter. I'm in this room in Senior Hall, and um, I think it was Nick and Brent. They came and they set me up. They got me the webcam. That's right, which I didn't need if I had a camera in the, in the laptop. They helped me set up this, this, this little camera. They said, just click here, and it will go. And I had a bit of a learning curve for me. I had, what does Tegrity do? Uh, what is exactly is it capturing? Um, and so I can tell you a little bit about that as well. Um, so in winter quarter, last quarter I used it, I tried to lecture capture using Tegrity virtually every class that I did, for better or worse, just to see what it would capture. Here's what Tegrity did for me. Number one, I've described some of the smart board that I use. Now, Senior Hall, where I was, is a great example. It had no physical smart board. So I'm in, I'm in this senior hall, very nice room, very technology heavy. There's a few cameras, I didn't know what they did. Um, 
and, and some other thing, the podium. I forgot, very good. But I'm up there doing my usual thing, come up with a laptop, no smart board. But I've got my wireless slate and I've got my, my lectures. Hit record on Tegrity. And Tegrity started capturing, um, it was like a screen capture. It would capture all the things that I was doing on my computer, which are reflected on the projector and onto the screen, and I'm controlling with a slate. Meanwhile, this other webcam, I guess they'd call it, another camera was set up on a tripod, would also capture me. And the end result, when you can go and you can see on, uh, on our Tegrity examples, you see these two windows. One of these windows is, like, for example, me doing something. The other window is the computer, what I'm doing on the computer. And um, getting used to that is what I really spent winter quarter doing. I, I do have to tell you, uh, I learned a lot, and now I'm ready for the next phase, what, how I want it to pay off for my students, for their learning. But any time with technology, the first step is you have to learn what can it do for you, what can it do for me, what can it do for these students. And uh, that's what I felt winter quarter was a lot, is me learning about Tegrity. It is very easy to use, um, but not, I wouldn't say it's limitations. I would say, um, what, what are the opportunities? <laughs> what can it do for you? Um, and that's, that's where I ended up with at the end of winter quarter. exactly why I wanted to use Tegrity aside from the research component for the teaching component I wanted it to be I wanted Tegrity to be as a resource for the students so I have a vision of what I want and I'll describe that for you with the caveat that I'm not exactly there yet but I'm moving there here's the end result what I want Tegrity to do we have some uh, some lessons maybe there's something we've done in class I'm working on a lesson for example now in, in probability great things we're doing, um, describing the problems, getting the student discussion, uh, working out some of these problems in different ways. You have to remember this is a class for teachers. So I'm not as interested in just one way of solving a problem as I am in multiple perspectives. What do you think a student will do? What do you think a student might do? How would you do this? How do you think a student would do this? If a student were to say this, what do you think that means? There's a lot of of interaction going on. I want a way to capture that and archive it so that for two reasons. Number one is students who aren't there physically in the classroom, they can access that from offsite. In, in a sense, I'm talking online, distance, uh, remote learning, people who aren't physically there. But even the students who are there, to go back later, um, say the next week and say, I want you to go back and look at that Tegrity capture we did or that lecture capture we did the week before and I, I want you to ask these questions. In other words, when you look at something a second time, you think of new questions, you think of new ideas that you hadn't, certainly is the case for me. I've been doing this for 25, 26 years doing mathematics teaching. It's always something new. Same for these students. So getting um, some kind of lecture, I'm saying lecture, but of course there's more to it than just lecture involved. Um, the, the whole classroom environment that we're capturing, um, to be able to reflect on that later is a big piece. But in order for my vision to take effect, it needs to be something that's watchable, that it actually was true to what I was trying to capture. And that's the, that's the fine tuning of, of, using, of learning to use Tegrity. Um, at the moment, some of the things I've, I've watched, I've recorded hours, and some of it is very good, and some of it I'm just flying in and out of the screen because I'm quite active in my teaching. So uh, I'm working with the e-learning folks to, um, to address some of the things that I want, and they're very supportive. Another good thing uh, for us here at Eastern. I've had a couple of different experiences with hybrid learning. Uh, first, I uh, was part of a, a design team that designed our integrated research methods class for the college, CSBS 330, and we decided to use a hybrid approach there. My other uh, experiences have been with individual classes 
and I'm always looking for opportunities to use a hybrid model that will enhance student learning and maximize my ability and my time to work with students on things that um, are not well suited for the hybrid environment. I've used several different ap approaches. Uh, I think everything always starts with course design and I usually try and really map out the course and the learning outcomes I want and then try and figure out the best ways to reach those. Um, one approach that I've used that has been really successful is to create concept maps which are visual pictures for the students that help them to understand the big picture of the concept. I also have many if not most of my lectures in a PowerPoint notes format for them to be able to follow along. From there I've used um, a couple of different things. I have a virtual chat room that I use for office hours sometimes to uh, provide students a little more access. Um, I, one thing I'm planning on using and have not yet but is my next project is to start using Tegrity and uh, get uh, uh, some of the things that are frequently asked questions uh, where I can do things and show things especially for example in research methods and I want them to uh, they all and all are in the same place on SPSS or, or Excel and I can show them things uh, that's real helpful Another thing I've done is in some of my classes I'm now using uh, the Respondus Lockdown browser and for online testing. The great thing about this is testing time is often just wasted time. You know, they're sitting there, they're doing their thing, I'm trying to assess them and, uh, and uh, with the Respondus Lockdown browser I don't have to use class time for that. Um, I set it up where they could take the test as many times as possible as they wanted and they had to achieve at least an 80 percent pass rate but they can achieve more too if they want and um, what I've discovered is a lot of learning takes place because if they take it and don't do well then they're supposed to go study and then come back and try it again the next day and um, that that's proved to be very successful. Um, I have a number of some of my PowerPoints with voiceovers on them and that's been nice because uh, what I don't want to do on some of those is have them watch that instead of coming to class and listening to me because there's a much much more uh, active when it's interactive in class. What I've started doing on those though is I will do the class lecture but then later post that for review and uh, that gives them a chance to go back and review things. It's also a way to for that student who had a legitimate reason not to be there to get caught up. One thing that I think is really important and I've learned this through trial and error and also with the good advice and counsel of the the uh, folks in e-learning is that it's really important to match the tools to what I'm trying to accomplish. And so uh, often I go in and I'm visiting with someone and saying, well this is what I'm trying to do. What tools are available? And then they talk to me about the tools and then I start exploring them with them and then I make up my mind and then I move forward with that tool. Um, I think uh, the learning process is really facilitated with students when it's a combination of face-to-face -face lectures, uh, coaching, mentoring, online materials and uh, what's important is to massage your materials and your class to meet your purpose. Uh, not every, I don't do the same things in every class. Some classes are much more uh, with the use of the hybrid and some are much less. But um, uh, one of the things I like about the hybrid approach is there's a certain amount of efficiency there. 
and anytime I can become more efficient, then it gives me more time to spend with the students doing coaching and mentoring, which is not possible, uh, at, or not as possible, uh, on, uh, in the e-learning world, uh, in the electronic world. Uh, or maybe it's just my style. I'd rather spend time talking face-to-face -face with a student about some things and not spend time on others. To summarize, what I really try and do is be very, very intentional in my use of uh, Blackboard and all of the other uh, tools. Um, and my goal, my primary goal is always the student's learning, uh, but my secondary goal is efficiency and effectiveness for me. Um, another example is uh, I have uh, one lecture that I use in almost every class that's kind of a leveling lecture. Well, I've actually got that stored where students can't see it in my uh, Dr. Stafford virtual advising site and then as needed I copy and paste it and moved it into my other uh, classes. Well that's very efficient for me and so I'm actually using the technology as my electronic storage place and I don't have to recreate things it's just a new copy and paste each quarter. Uh, another uh, and so there are several things like that that I do and so good luck have fun and uh, uh, explore the, the, world, the electronic world because the, the hybrid courses have really helped me, I think, to become more effective in my teaching.